Why is it that this silhouette of a storm-battered, leafless tree at sunset is considered beautiful? When this corresponding silhouette of a multi-purpose university facility is not. The mathematician Beno Mandelbrot in the mid-80s said, simple shapes fail to resonate with the way that nature organises itself and as a consequence fails to resonate with the way that we, as nature's product, are organised. So, in his mind, nature is the benchmark for our understanding and if things are not consistent or coherent with nature, then they don't mean a great deal to us. Now, this is Euclidean geometry and it is a very powerful tool that has been one of the fundamental principles of our civilization. It's the mathematics that we learn in high school. It's the relationships between points in space. It's the relationships within physical constructs. And we also learn platonic solids, cubes, spheres, dodecahedrons. These are a particular kind of object, a particular kind of intellectual construct that is based on observable phenomena. However, when do you really see a pyramid unless it's made by man? When do you really see a pure sphere? These are abstract ideas that don't represent the nature of the nature that we experience every day. They're beautiful, they're profound, but they're rare. And there is another kind of mathematics that explains the rest of everything the profound nature of everything. And until the advent of computing, it was almost impossible for us to have any insight into this. Euclidean geometry has been the geometry that my occupation has used for thousands of years. Uh, the ancient Greeks, the Roman Empire, used Euclidean mathematics to modulate and conform their architecture. It was a coherent system that related to their religion and their ideology that explained their world view. That's a world view that we find untellable today. We have progressed. We do have computers. We do have the ability to process vast amounts of information. At this point in time, that was extremely difficult. So, the idealised version of mathematics was something that profoundly affected the way that we built our civilization, And we still use this today. Euclidean geometry and platonic shapes are the principal geometries that we use in architecture today. It's the geometry of planes, the geometry of surfaces. It's simple, it's rational, and in many senses, it's very beautiful. And simple shapes are easy to understand. We can look at this and see, that's a cube, that's a curve. It, it's something that is relatively easy for us to have an emotional and intellectual connection to. However, it doesn't really represent what's going on here. There is something very complex that clearly has an order about it, which is not reflected in these shapes here. And there's a reason for that. In 1979, Beno Mandelbrot, at the time he was part of IBM's Pure Research Division, and he had access to IBM's mainframe computer, the biggest, most powerful computer in the world. Instead of it taking days to do a calculation, he could do millions of calculations a second. And he produced this image, and it's called a Mandelbrot set. If you zoom in across scale, what you find is the patterns repeat. And as you continue to zoom in, you begin to discover that things repeat. There is self-similarity across scale. And you start to find 
that within the nature of numbers, within the nature of mathematics, there is an order that is very similar to the forms that we find in ferns and in, in sea life and many other forms of natural systems. What this means is that there is a deep insight here into the nature of nature. What this shows us is there is a profound and incredibly interesting and meaningful notion within architecture and within geometry that can be applied to the real world. And this is one of our first experiments with trying to design a building that contains process because the nature of nature is about process. It's not about simple singular events, it is about the feedback, it's about the process of nature. And in this building we did use Euclidean geometry, these are sine curves, we could deal with this relatively simply through mathematics, but what we were able to do with this project is capture some kind of sense of emotion. This is a building that is about its place, it's about its context. It's about building a building on the beach that captures the breezes, that captures the notion that this is a special place where most other buildings are rectilinear and based on construction or efficiency. In this project, we were looking at trying to create something that meant something to people. And I think, you know, having lived in Broad Beach for the last few years, I, I have come to realise that many people stop and take photographs of this building. They may not know what we're on about, they may not realise that as the shadows fall across the building it becomes more sculptural and for us it gives us a real emotional sense of connection to place. But nonetheless there seems to be something that people respond to. It's not entirely parametric, it's not that complex but it, it expresses something, and that's, I think, what Pevsner was talking about, some self-evident excess, which is extrinsic to it being a building, but it's intrinsic to it being a work of architecture. And, and this is the corner where people stand and take photographs. And like I said, they don't really necessarily understand what we're on about, but they know we're on about something. And this is another building in Broad Beach, another one of our Gold Coast projects. And this is about taking crystalline forms like the headlands of Fingal and Burley and exploring organic forms and, and how do we express what it means to be a physical object in a dynamic environment with waves and breezes. There's also an, a, a very obvious allusion to the whales that migrate along the coast that was very conscious in our minds at the time because we felt that those marine mammals said something meaningful about the place. And while the ground plane and the context is very much about urbanism and about how people move through places, the towers are an emotional and physical expression of what it is to live adjacent the ocean where these kind of activities occur. And you can see that this is a fairly unusual building and it's a building that people do seem to have some emotional connection to. And, and we're continuing to explore this in other projects we're working on. This is one for the Gold Coast as well, where we've taken the confidence out of the projects that we've done in the past to really push the sculptural power of buildings. In this building, we're using really quite advanced software to help us manipulate and plot certain surfaces within the building. The building's inspired by marine life and by the context of the place, and there's a very obvious allusion to oceans and sea creatures in this, but there's no way we could have delivered this building 20 years ago when I was a student, that there were, we could not have drawn it on a drawing board. When I went to university, we did a subject called computing, where we spent weeks writing code to draw a square. <laughs> yeah. 
which was about as exciting as licking wallpaper, you know. But now we have the power in our computer systems to be able to not only explore these beautiful formal environments, but also include very complex and very sophisticated environmental responses in our work. This is an incredibly sustainable building that rejects heat, admits light, and does extremely clever things. So this diagram, in the background there, you can see what we call a parametric system. So a parametric software is a software where the parameters are defined by us. We simply put a series of numbers into these equations and the computer works out what it is. If we put in the right number, if we're subtle about it, then we can subtly change the form. However, if we put in the wrong number, it goes berserk and you get insane things. We've 3D printed models that are just a massive plastic spaghetti. One of the most exciting and thrilling things for us is the advent of 3D printing. But the real power of this, I think, and what thrills us, is the capacity to explore and develop systems and ideas that mimic nature. These are some of the prototypes we've been working on in our exploration and our practice. And this is a building that is being 3D printed using crushed building rubble and cement and natural fibres. It's Euclidean geometry, straight lines, simple curves, but it's not far away that we can start doing this with 3D printing. And I sincerely think that it is not long before that kind of technology will support us in building buildings that are entirely bespoke, that are constructed in situ, in place, so they're indelibly connected to place and are an authentic expression of place. So why is it that this storm-battered leafless tree at sunset is considered beautiful and this corresponding silhouette of any multi-purpose university is not, it is because simple shapes fail to resonate with the way that it, nature is organised and therefore, as a consequence, fails to resonate with the way that we, as nature's product, are organised. And I think that we stand right now at the thrilling and enthralling precipice of having the computing power to replicate nature in our architecture, in our built environment, and I think that will profoundly affect the nature of our lives. Thank you.